Okay, um, why don't we get started? We have a few more people joining us. And I will say one last time, welcome to everyone. Um, this is an online event, completely online. I am Lisa Garrison. I am a trustee here at the Farnsworth. Each year, the Farnsworth presents the Maine in America Award. The award honors an individual or group who has made an outstanding contribution to Maine's role in American art. This year, we have the honor of the Maine in America Award honoring 13 visionary women who have made that significant contribution to the arts in Maine. This talk, Women Artists at Work, will be with two of our awardees, Sig Harvey and Catherine Bradford. Sig is an artist who uses images and language to explore sensory experience and elevate the everyday. This sense of what it is to feel is illustrated throughout her photography and writing. She is the author of four books, which sold out immediately. Her photographs and books are in the permanent collections of major American museums. Catherine is an artist who began painting while living in Maine in the 70s. Her work uses a vibrant palette, pared down forms and eccentric compositions, which allow her to dip into an otherworldly dimension. She has had shows in New York, London, Paris, and Berlin. And just last week, she added another award to many she has already received, the Rappaport Award. This evening, we are fortunate to have as moderator, Suzette McAvoy. Suzette is an independent curator and the former executive director and chief curator at the Center for Maine Contemporary Art as well as a former curator here at the Farnsworth. She has organized numerous exhibitions of the work of contemporary artists and has lectured and written extensively on the arts and artists in Maine. Suzette is the ideal person to lead the discussion with Sig and Catherine. I do want to just remind everyone to please put any of your answers in the Q&A function. We will have time available to answer your questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Lisa, for that introduction and the opportunity to speak tonight with Sig Harvey and Catherine Bradford, two artists whose work I've long admired and who are truly women of vision. Um, Kathy, I think I first started seeing your work in the early 1990s at Bernie Toll Gallery in Boston. And then of course you had the show here at the Farnsworth in 1996 with Mark Wetley, when at the time you were working abstractly and Mark was working figuratively. And of course now you both switch, so to speak, and you're working figuratively and Mark is working abstractly. And both of you are using much more color, I might add. And then Sig, I first started seeing your work almost 20 years ago now in the early 2000s at galleries here in the mid coast. And then you had that wonderful show in Rockport at the old CMCA in 2002 called Tread Softly. Um, so you both are, um, are artists whose work I've, I've eagerly followed over the decades. Um, I have to confess that on first being asked to lead a conversation with the two of you, I didn't think that there was much commonality in your work or in your approach as artists. But I have to say, the more that I've looked and the more that I've spoken with the two of you, there was some really interesting connections, at least for me, that have bubbled to the surface. Um, so I'd like to start our conversation tonight by reading a quote from the noted art historian, Karen Wilkin, uh, who writes, she keeps us off balance because of the ambiguity of her images, which read like fragmented memories or imperfectly recalled dreams, 
even the most straightforward images suggest that there's more going on than we realize at first acquaintance. And David, if I could have the first pair of slides. So here we're seeing, Kathy, your work on the left and Sig, yours on the right. And I think that this quote by Karen Wilkin uh, really aptly applies to both of your work. She happened to have written it, Kathy, about your work, but I see those, you know, that idea of fragmented memories and these and the ambiguity that is implied in your images um, that, that I think runs through um, both of your work. Um, so we're going to look right now um, at a, uh, a sequence of pairing of both of your work and maybe discuss some of these interesting, you know, common themes, both formally and in terms of content um, that, that I see running through your work. And then once we finish that, we move into our general conversation. Um, we'll go into a sort of a rotating slideshow, one of your paintings, Kathy, one of your photographs, um, Sig, that will just run in the background here as we continue our conversation. So if we could have the next pair of slides. Suzette? Yes. Can I say something about the two images that you just showed? Yes, indeed you can. I, what I love about Sig's is she has an uneven lighting running over those flowers. I don't know how she did that, but there's bright light on some and dark light on some, which makes what could be a just very flowery image have a, a kind of dark side, if, if you must. I mean, at first it looks beautiful like a garden, but then it's, it's I started thinking of death because of those dark spots. I mean, it could be some kind of funeral also. It's not all hope. I, I love that you got both, both in this image. Thank you, Kathy. I uh, also, I mean, first of all, it's such an honor to be here. Kathy is one of my all time heroes and so is Suzette. So I feel, you know, and it takes a lot to put on these conversations and, you know, yet alone the award. So thank you everyone at the Farnsworth and um, particularly Kathy and Suzette for being here and doing this tonight. Um, but when I saw this first slide, uh, when you sent them to me, Suzette, I sort of gasped. It's one of my favorites of um, Kathy's work, these six women, the pull of the moon, the the stars, I mean, it's it sort of, it, this this painting of yours takes my breath away. And I love that it has that sort of, it has this pull, something really um, primordial. It has this sort of hope, but it also, there's a sort of unsettling and unrest. And so I, I sort of see that, what you're saying about my photograph of the compost heap, also in your painting. Mm -hmm. Certainly there's that commonality of these beautiful, you know, the brightness of it, but then there's also this sort of reaching, Kathy. I mean, when I look at this and it looks like swimming on the moon and are you oh. looking back at the earth from the moon? So, you know, there is that otherworldly quality and that ambiguity to both of your work, which I think carries through. If we could have the next slides, you can see certainly this quality of light that you mentioned, Kathy, and, and how you both use this indeterminate um, a light that adds this luminosity that seems to come out of the depths of your work and comes to the surface. And I know, Sig, you've mentioned, you know, discovering that delightful word lambent, that, mm -hmm. that, that word of meaning, you know, this, this idea of glowing, gleaming, flickering with soft radiance. And, and Kathy, you've said, my light is different. It's more like Rothko's. It's not directional. It's luminous. And, you know, personally, I can really see that in this pairing of images, as I can in many of yours. But if you'd like to both add something, too, I'm happy to have your response to this group. Sig, is, are, are those flowers sitting on water? No, they're being pulled underneath the water. So what's happening is that there's a, the arm is coming in from the right. And so the bubbles are coming, the, the air bubbles are coming from um, the flowers being pulled underneath the water. But the, but the black is water. 
It is, it's a quarry. You know, I'm drawn to places, um, you know, to photograph in quarries and, and in places that sort of feel otherworldly. And I think that's another sort of connection that I see in our work of just trying to find locations and bodies of water that sort of, I don't know, spin us around. Well, I remember when I was painting my, my painting called um, Desire for Transport of these six little black boats, I got frustrated because the water is just so dark and briny looking. And so I started adding color to it nonsensically. It didn't make any sense. And that's how all the people in the boats got sort of pageantry costumes and hats on. It was frustration with the darkness of water. I often I feel, yeah. Yeah, I think we're both dealing with that in this pair. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Could we have the next slides, please? And, and this, what I wanted to point out is this otherworldly quality that I find in both of your work. It's as where, you know, yes, there's one foot in this world. We know that, you know, there's an element of, of, of the real world here in terms of the figures and all, but it's almost like we've entered this portal to another world. And I, I just love this pairing, this girl looking up and Kathy, us looking down at this water with, again, this wonderful luminous quality in the light. Just, you, you know, you just transport us to, um, I think, uh, I'm not, I think it was um, Sig that you wrote something about what you look to is something that is real, but feels like it could be a little bit unreal. And that's certainly a quality I see in, in this pair of work of yours. Yeah, I'm, I think I'm going to start putting um, fish in my skies. <laughs> I love it. It seems yeah. so much <laughs> so much more interesting. <laughs> you know, I think that, um, you know, there's a question in the chat from Ariel about like, you know, this idea of why, you know, why this use of the otherworldly. And, you know, I think in both of our works, we're very much grounded in the everyday. I mean, thinking about your swimmers and, and um, these sort of act of what people are doing, they're very sort of, they're hugging, they're moving about the ordinary, which is something that I talk about a lot in my work. Um, but trying to look at it through somewhat askew, trying to look at it through sort of a fresh way, whether that's the light that we're using, something that sort of makes the everyday just that little bit more rare. So that's what I'm after and why I'm sort of drawn to light that is sort of the gloaming hour or um, lambent light or you know something that just is a little bit of a shock or a gasp. I remember driving by a big billboard and it said, tune into this news program for reality. And I remember thinking, hell no, I, I'm not going to. I, the news is a big dose of too much reality. And I feel a great need to go to, to a beautiful world that's out there. It exists. And to remember that along with this whole year of bad news. Well, you both have, um, have really created these wonderful magical looking images and, and transported and that's so helpful and uplifting I think in this year, particularly seeing work like this. Kathy, I love that they look like they're, you know, camping in this time on the moon and Sig, you know, she's like swimming underwater and looking up. Um, but you mentioned this sort of magic quality, this, this taking the ordinary and, and lifting um, it into this other world. And if we could have the next pair of slides, I think that that's, this magic quality is particularly evident in this and in this pair. I think Kathy, yours looks like he has a magic wand and he's like, you know, gesturing and creating these wonderful drops of light. And then say, you know, you're, you're having this, you know, the, the disco ball, you know, taking this this everyday object and holding it and creating in this wonderful barn, you know, all these droplets of light. And I know, Kathy, you mentioned to me that this is one of your um, favorite images by, by Sig, that this idea of the disco ball and these, um, you know, these, this fragmented light um, really resonated with you. Well, you know, Suzette, I think here, you really show your brilliance as a curator yeah. to put these two side by side. It's just wonderful. I, I mean, holding a ball of light and the guy 
in my painting touching these balls of light, I was going to say, you, you'd make a great curator, Susan. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was very fun curating this uh, this slideshow of your images and putting them together in this way, I have to say. Um, I, I, I really uh, love to see the connections in your work because I think there's a spirit that runs through through your work that even goes beyond the imagery, you know, and, and that is is about um, uh, your your approach as artists to the world and and in, in who you are as women that that really speaks to um, how the imagery comes out in the work itself. Um, now, we, I have had a request for people to name, to um, identify the titles of these works. Um, can you both maybe, if you, do you remember the title of this one, Kathy? Yes, it's called Night Clock. So what you see as a wand touching light, I saw as um, the, the hours of the clock, and perhaps he's a night watchman. Uh, nice. And mine is just, my titles are often, the book titles are often uh, uh, more esoteric, but this is just Scout and the Disco Ball. But, but in your newest book, Blue mm -hmm. Violet, there's a wonderful story of you buying this Disco Ball and all the things you did with it. Yeah, and actually I worked with this disco ball today. So when it's a really dark winter in Maine, um, I drive around with this disco ball in my car. And it, every time you make a left, you know, it explodes with light. And it's this idea of just living with light in a way that feels, you know, somehow just elevated. And so, um, you know, and for a while it was in my kitchen, the first year of my marriage, this disco ball, which came from Goodwill, was in our bedroom. So you wake up to this, you know, kaleidoscope of sparkles. And, you know, I think that's what I'm always trying to do, both in life and in my pictures and words, is, is to just try and um, uh, bring something that perhaps might bring joy, just, or you notice the, notice the world in a slightly different way, you know? Or or enchantment. Right. Mm, love that word. Nice. Well, let's look at the next set of slides and talk about joy and color. And Sig, I think you're sitting in front of this wall that is in your photo on the, on the right here. And Kathy, here's your red studio where you're ripping on Matisse's, you know, very joyful red studio painting and Sig, this same color shows up in so much of your work and you are both noted, I mean, really esteemed for your use of color and the sort of emotional resonance that comes through your use of color. Um, and it both heightens the drama of it or I think heightens the emotion of the, of the piece. So um, do you wanna both talk about, you know, your approach to color? Well, yeah, yeah, you go first, Kathy. I could talk for an hour on color. I know Kathy could too, so. Yeah. This, this is called Red Studio Brooklyn because uh, in Bushwick, well, all over Brooklyn, the artists have studios in repurposed industrial buildings. And I thought Matisse might be interested in that, that we have these big windows it's a great feeling to be in your studio at night and looking out. These are not stars, these are the city lights. Mm -hmm. And that's what, the, that was the idea behind this painting. And I mean, who doesn't love red? Yeah. But we both put red with darkness mm -hmm. and white. Mm -hmm. And then Sig's little um, forsythia blossoms on the floor, which I thought, you know, really sort of echoed the city lights, um, you know, those little bits of light there, almost as if there's stars on the dark ground, the way you have the lights out the dark window. I thought it was a wonderful sort of yin yang of, 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 of red and dark and, and that lightness that's there. Yeah, I mean, I love the way you've connected these two images. I mean, this for me was a very, you know, very sort of found image in the sense that I was painting the wall and and um, had been forcing for Scythia and the two came together and this you know took one image 
Um, you know, but color for me is a, you know, I think sometimes there's this perception that color is somewhat frivolous or decorative. And I really, you know, disagree. I feel like color, color is a serious business and we know it affects the body. It is a scientific fact. And, you know, historically, um, you know, man's relationship to color is particularly in times of, um, you know, need and death and dying. And so I, you know, I have a, a, a love of color that has, you know, I can trace back to being a child and you know more and more I'm leaning into it and sort of exploring it further like I it is a huge um aspect to my work sometimes I wonder if it's not just all about color I mean it, but. I think that color needs color next to it so the term color relationships maybe is more apt yeah. I, I don't think we see red I think we see red next to, to dark brown or dark blue here. Mm. And that is what resonates. And um, interesting, yeah. that's what I feel is important. Well, let's look at another example where you're using color in a different way. But in this one, I wanted to talk about both of your use of cropping, because I think you both use the cropped figure in really interesting ways to heighten the action in the in the image. Um, you you know, in this case, that that arm pressing against the screen, and then Kathy, the arms and the and the one foot coming in from the or the feet coming in from the side. You feel that sense of pressure. I think more than if you saw the whole figure, because you're putting our focus right onto that sense of that touch, that that plate, you know, and you're sort of implying that there's more going on outside of the image than we can see. So there's that implied action, and then there's the expressed action that is sort of concentrated by your, you know, your really interesting use of cropping. And I think if someone's to look at more of your work over the body of it, both of you use really interesting tight cropping of the figure. So do we each have any thoughts on, on that? Or well, a, a lot of people have asked me what my painting is about and, and, and it's taken me a long time. Well, actually, I don't know what it's about. I needed those arms and foot coming in Formally, I needed the tension. Mm -hmm. If it, if I just felt I, if I just had the figure in the center, it, it wasn't enough. And some people think the figure is being supported by all those limbs. But actually, at the time I painted it, I was feeling a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure to perform, I guess, and people pushing me this way and that. I love the blue hand in your in this painting of yours, Kathy. I, it's sort of extraordinary, and then the foot, wonderful, right in the gut. Um, you know, for me, I think it's so much about you know the sense of touch as well. I mean, that is something that I think we both have that in common. And you, you know, we we're visual artists, but you know the the other senses and the sense of touch being felt all over the body. Um, you know, that's something I really explore in my pictures. So this picture of mine, and I love thinking about the relationship of that purple to the, to the, um, to the, the dark, to the black, um, but it's about the fingertips and how they're pressing up against yeah. the screen. Yeah, nice. And, and you don't realize that there's a screen there until you look yeah. carefully. Nice. Uh, next slides. And in this one, what I wanted to really point out is point of view. Um, another thing that I sort of noticed in looking at a broad swath of your work is that you both often uh, take a point of view of the, of the positioning the viewer um, in an elevated position, sort of uh, uh, to the upper right often, or we're often like standing outside the picture plane and and a little bit elevated and we're looking down on the action as if we're sort of walking by and looking off to our left and sort of just discovering what's there and I love that sense of discovery or the sense that you know you're you know that there's this sort of stage 
where the action is happening and we're and we're just chancing on it. I, um, so that's what I wanted to sort of show in this, you know, in this group of work, Kathy, you know, you often take this point of view of the viewer is sort of outside, you know, looking down and seeing in this case, I feel like I'm standing up on the hill and just happen to be walking down and I look and I see this amazing image of this woman, you know, again, I think sort of heightens that otherworldly quality, um, but you're inviting the viewer in to participate in the image, I think, in this way. You know, I, I actually didn't realize I was doing that. I, I always thought I just painted flat scenes. It does seem, certainly in six, we're looking down. And to me, the whole that whole photograph comes alive because of the white splash of light on the water. Mm, again, that luminous, that lambent light <laughs> that's there, yes. Yeah, it's terrific. Yeah. I love seeing how, you know, the circles, the, in this painting on the left, it feels, you know, it feels like I'm an astronaut. And I know you had mentioned that, uh, Suzette, this idea of sort of an astronaut from space, but it's sort of giving that, that reference of at once being of the earth, but also of space. Absolutely. Uh, next slides. Hmm. And then... <laughs> This is amazing. I, can you always, I'd like to always do my slideshows with Kathy, please. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, so this is a recent image of yours of this uh, floating. And of course, Kathy, you painted um, many swimmers at night, but I know it's really about the visual metaphor here. It's not so much about, you know, the figure swimming at night, but about the visual metaphor that's, that's evident. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about you know, why the swimmer at night? You know, someone asked me if I go swimming at night and the answer is no, <laughs> because it's cold. This is Maine, the water is cold and, and we're suggesting that there's a little light out there in the water, but actually there isn't. I don't, I don't know where the light is coming from in your image, Sig, and I made a fake moon and a fake sky, but I can tell you when people swim at night, it's pretty black, wow. unless you have an electric light. I think just when I say the phrase, the open ocean at night, it makes me think of strange things happening, the open ocean at night, anything could happen. We, we're, we're, it's just a place where monsters could come up from the sea and mm. pilots and the, whole, and the whole thing. I just think it's very poignant. And we, and we both picked single figures alone, mm. which I think is important. But I, I'm not sure what we're trying to say about that. Maybe the solitude of but it's also, you know, it is it is that sort of wonderland and 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 a, a stage for so much potential. But it's also night swimming. If I think back to my sort of fondest memories as a child, it was night swimming. You know, there's something that's really decadent and it reminds you that you're alive. To go, I'm going to go tonight for sure. I'm going to go. I do swim at night, so I'm going to swim at the lake in the lake tonight. I'm not going to swim in the ocean, but. I can't wait to jump in on this hot day. And there's something that's so freeing and it's free. And just this idea of just sort of living and feeling that water. And, you know, I, I, I for me, it's very much a place of, of wonder as well as sort of terror. And I think, you know, the, the quarry sort of provides both of that. It's both beautiful and frightening. And I think having that sort of dichotomy is, is an interesting push pull. Yeah. Next slide. Well, and I, so I'd like to conclude this, uh, these comparisons um, with what I think is the most important quality that your work shares, and that's the quality of empathy. Um, in Sig's most recent book, Blue Velvet, the writer Jacoba Urist writes, um, and most stunningly, Blue Velvet is about empathy and the vast potential of beauty if only for a heartbeat or two to bridge what seems 
more and more like irrevocable chasms. And I think of this statement, Kathy, in relation to your recent work in the show Mother Paintings at Canada Gallery this past spring. Um, we're seeing one of those paintings, Mother's Lap, I believe, here um, from that series, which was all about connection and touching. Um, and save your uh, photo, sisters here, um, looking at this um, you know, uh, nest with these robin's eggs in it. Um, there's a wonderful sense of empathy that runs through all of your work, the sense of humanity. And um, can you each maybe speak about this quality of empathy and how you see it in terms of your own work? Or if you think of that in terms of your work. Kathy, if you want to start. Well, um, people use the word empathy a lot with President Biden, and it's a real shift from the former president. So I think it's something that we are thinking about now. But the title of this Zoom is Women Artists at Work. Is that right? But both, both Sig and I are surrounded by family. And so that's bound to come into play, um, nurturing our children and relatives and in-laws and mates. I, I think it's, it's part of our lives it's, it, and is bound to get into our work. Nice. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think for me and the human experience, which is what you're sort of describing, empathy is a human, the, you know, probably the, one of the most important human experiences. So it is absolutely something that I'm, um, you know, interested in as a sort of central theme, um, you know, and I think it, empathy has become highlighted during this time that was, you know, very difficult, you know, politically, um, COVID. Uh, so, you know, this idea that we are so, we have, more, you know, I think art can remind us that we have more in common than we are, than we have, differences. And, um, you know, I know that nature does that, for example, people can unite over nature and sort of foster conversation over a, a sunset and how, you know, the world is extraordinary or the, the night sky or the lake at night or something. And I think that that to me, um, you know, is, is really important. I think art does that too, that we can not necessarily agree on politics, but we can agree and we can find common ground on beauty or relationships or touch. Um, so that for me has become more and more um, such a sort of, uh, uh, the sort of heartbeat under the floorboards. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Heartbeat under the floorboards, I'll take that. <laughs> There's your next book. <laughs> Well, if we could have the next slides and then just rotate through them um, as we continue to speak about a few other uh, topics. Um, Kathy, you, you um, referenced this, but the idea of motherhood. Um, I think uh, in terms of that, Sig, one of the things that you wrote in Blue Velvet is growing roses is an act of courage and there are many ways to be brave. And that phrase, there are many ways to be brave has really resonated with me um, in terms of when I think uh, both in terms of both of your work, in terms of how you've approached the world as artists, as mentors and mothers, um, you both seem to have very successfully defied the odds of the old cliche um, art versus motherhood. Or as Tracy Eamon so famously said, there are good artists that have mother that have children. Of course, there are. They are called men. Um, and, uh, you know, so I know you both had very different experiences. Kathy, you're the mother of grown twins, and Sig, you're the mother of a ten-year-old. But how has motherhood impacted your your life as artists? And um, this is a talk on on women artists at work. Want to speak a bit about? Your can, can, I, can I just say something? Um, I thought maybe I was crazy because I've been calling Sig's book Blue Violet. Yes. And that is actually the title. It's, and you've been calling it Blue Velvet. I like, I like both. It's a great reference. Yeah. 
I know. I thought, oh, oh my goodness, the book is called Blue Velvet. Now I'm confusing everyone, but it's actually blue, two colors, blue and violet. Huh. Right. If I've misspoken, I'm so sorry. I, <laughs> well, so um, do you want to speak about your, as, as, do you feel like your experience as artists and mothers has, has played into your work, maybe SIG, maybe more so. Um, but Kathy, I know you had an interesting, you know, your, your start as an artist was to move to Brooklyn with your twins and, and begin a life as an artist. This, this painting on the screen now is called Parents and Child. There you go. There you go. <laughs> You know, I, I mean, for me, when I became a mother, my, I felt like my pictures in my writing got stronger because my world got more complicated. And, you know, feeling all the feelings of how the joy and the terror and all of that. So, you know, and, and joy and terror are excellent ex ingredients for art, you know. So I think that um, for me, that that experience, I mean, obviously there are the challenges of every day in terms of time and all of that, which we could go into, um, you know, but for me, it's, it's um it's it it's been a not only the experience of being a mom is a wonderful thing but just also how it's affected the, the work that i'm making um so i i um always encourage younger artists to go ahead and have children because god willing um you might like me come into your 70s and, and have the children are grown and maybe you don't have to take a teaching job and, and you have time to be in your studio. And so you have all that and a family mm -hmm. that, that has grown up and you can watch. So I, I, think, I think it's possible and I'm glad you brought that up, mm -hmm. Suzette. Well, I, I think it speaks to both of your incredible work ethic that you have, um, that you have been able to successfully manage um, both um, your, your being um, successful mothers and also successful artists at the same time, because you are both really noted for having an um, amazing work ethic. And I know, Kathy, you said, when I wake up in the morning, I'm not going to fool around. I'm going to get into the studio and say, you've said, I get up early, feed the dog, put on the coffee and get to work. Um, what is a typical day like for both of you? Do yeah. you have studio assistants? Um, do you feel like your work ethic has played into your success? And do you think of yourself as ambitious? I mean, one thing you're missing there that I think it's, is also that I very quietly creep past everyone so no one wakes up because that is my time, you know? I mean, that's really important, especially during COVID. I was like getting up earlier and earlier, 4.30 and 3.30 in the morning to, you know, to have this uninterrupted time and how to make that happen, you know? So I, um, I you know, it's, it's finding those pockets of time, I think are so important. I'm sure, Kathy, you have a similar experience of that. Well, um, recently a friend said to me, um, Oh, oh, Kathy, people, people like your work and you're getting to show a lot. Um, and it's because you're so disciplined. And, and I didn't like hearing that. I wish she'd said, it's because you're so wild and crazy, something like that. I mean, the whole discipline thing, I think is just one side of making artwork. Um, it, it is important, um, but uh, actually I'm trying to develop the side that breaks rules, that tries new frontiers, that uh, wakes up everybody in the house. <laughs> <laughs> you both have taught for many years as well, and you are, um, you know, extremely generous with your time to other artists. And um, can you speak about the role of teaching in your work and this idea of how, of the importance of community to artists? 
I think that go, what goes along with being an artist is um, the thought that we became artists because we apprenticed to other artists, maybe really, or maybe through reading or seeing videos, but learning from other artists seems built in. And, and I'm sure Sid has been strongly influenced by what she's seen in the visual world. And so have I. And, and so I know that you, you're not, you don't exist alone. You're having conversations, maybe just visual ones, with lots of other people, even though you're all alone in your studio. And if you encounter another artist, I think it is important to connect in some way. It's, it's one of the most wonderful things about the art world. Thanks. Wonderful. Here we've connected tonight, I think, in a way, you know, that um, it's through, pretty strange. Through even in this conversation, you know, this idea of extending the connections between work and between artists, even working in different mediums in very different ways. But you see that same, you know, I think as visual artists, you know, you're always taking in information in what you see. And um, so, and something so beautiful about the exchange of ideas as well. And, you know, and making art, as Kathy's talking about, is, you know, such a solitary experience. So, you know, to be out in the world teaching, connecting with people, touching, you know, talking, trying to put words to this sort of impossible thing of what we're doing every day that feels like it just comes from the gut. So I think that exchange of trying to talk to, you know, students or mentors or, you know, that's a really beautiful thing um, to, to share and to struggle with together, you know. I love hearing how as much as you are, you know, um, teaching and, and giving of information um, to other artists that you are also learning from other artists and taking in. You, you're, you, you both just express that so beautifully that, you know, you're, you're so open um, to other ideas and to the work of other artists, as well as so giving of your own knowledge and um, as, as to, you, to your students. So, um, you know, this painting right here, this Sig's photograph could be a painting. Mm. It just, it looks like Ross Blechner to me. I can't imagine how you got that. It's all over. It's, it's, have you thought of that? Do you think this looks like a painting? It does. Um, I mean, I think the textural quality, that velvet of the petunias, I mean, oh, it's, it's, um, uh, you know, they're, they're sort of an extraordinary flower and often sort of overlooked, which is what I love about them. And the color, they're really drawn to the color in this. Um, but it's like this luscious buildup of brush strokes. Mm. Beautiful. But it's a field. You know, I, I didn't even think of petunias. Mm -hmm. Is that what you said they were? Yeah. Wow. You know, and another thing, this idea of, you know, teaching, I mean, I think I, I don't know about Kathy, but I don't have an assistant. I work alone. Sometimes I get emails saying, oh, can I intern with you? And I was like, my dog is my intern, you know, like it's a sort of solitary world. And so I think teaching just takes us outside of ourselves, you know. Nice. Well, I can't believe the time has just absolutely flown by. I see that we've already spoken for 45 minutes now, and I know that we want to allow time for questions. So, um, but I can't end this conversation on celebrating two great women artists without at least a passing reference to Linda Nochlin's now famous 1971 essay, uh, Why Have There Been No Great Women Artists? Um, in, that was published in, in Art News um, and, uh, you know, in which she sort of lays out the institutional op obstacles that prevented women from succeeding in the arts. And Louise Nevelson, another of the Farnsworth Women of Vision, who we are celebrating this year, was one of the eight uh, women artists who was asked to respond in writing to Linda Nochlin's essay. And um, in her response, which she actually titled uh, Do Your Work, which I love, you know, Nevelson was so straightforward in her talking, you know, her, her response was, was titled Do Your Work. She wrote, when we come on earth, we come with the equipment of awareness. That is the common denominator of humanity. And I have to say, I love this notion of being equipped with awareness. 
it seems to me that you both have that quality in spades and that the role of art is to deepen and broaden our innate awareness in a sense to make us more present to the world, to ourselves and to others. And Kathy, you've said, I like the present tense, I really do. And when you're making a painting and you can stay in the present tense, it's great. And Sig, you've said, trying to elevate the ordinary, that's my life's work. So I wanna thank you both for making us more aware uh, more present to the moment and for elevating the ordinary. We are so grateful to you and thank you for your art. Um, now we'll, if you're willing, we'll take some questions from the audience and maybe we can have the slides run, um, continue to run while we take questions. So you're not just looking at the two of us unless you want to do that. So let's see what we have. Um, Oh, so the first one is about reading Ninth Street Women uh, with so much about being a woman, an artist and a woman. And I'm interested in your comments on the book if you've read it and your experiences in the art world. So have I, it took me all last summer, but I, I read it. Have either of you read um, the book Ninth Street Women? Yes, I, I absolutely love that book. And I felt intimately involved with each one of them. But there, there were five, right? Should we say their names? Uh, I'm not sure if I can remember all of them. Um, uh, there's... <laughs> well, anyway. And, yeah. Lee, Lee Krasner and uh, Grace Hardigan and like Helen Frankenthaler and... Um, who did I leave out? Joan Mitchell. Um, they, they died what I would consider young, younger than I am now. And that struck me because um, they lived hard. None of them cooked dinner. None of them seemed to even eat vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot about how much they drank because I think it wasn't known mm -hmm. that was bad for you, and and they and they had and they had to survive each one, mm -hmm. and um, Grace Hardigan abandoned her son. That struck me, yes. and they all had to cope with their male husbands or lovers, which played a big part in the in that book. And the one who seemed to have the most crazy life was Joan Mitchell, who was perhaps the most respected of all of them, the most revered. Um, so someone asked me to please repeat the introductory quote from Karen Wilkins. So I will read that again. Um, this was a, something that she wrote in the essay for Kathy's book, um, Catherine Bradford Paintings, published by Canada Gallery, um, which I believe is available at the Farnsworth Bookstore. Um, Karen Wilkin is a, is a really, but I think that this really aptly applies as well to Sig's work, because it, it's what got me thinking about the connections between both of you. What she says is she keeps us off balance because of the ambiguity of her images which read like fragmented memories or imperfectly recalled dreams. Even the most straightforward images suggest that there's more going on than we realize at first acquaintance. So um, someone is asking Sig about how um, you first got into photography and how long the learning curve was that you feel be, um, that before she got where you did, where you are. You know, this is a great image. The flowers and the meat cleaver. I mean, talk about tension. Mm. Talk about unexpected. And there's that, and there's that cropping again, that hand that just, that comes right. in from the side. Yeah, mm -hmm. love it. Um, thank you guys, I, it means a lot. Um, I worked in a dark room when I was 13, I'm 47 now. Um, so I have always 
been in this, you know, as long as I can remember. Um, it really took until I was probably 25 that when I came to Maine, Maine has been, I, we haven't sort of spoken much about Maine, but for me, Maine is a, a you know, is a, is a, very strong thread that runs through my work. Um, and I feel like I'm a Mainer. Uh, so it was coming here where I think I found my visual voice, but I'm a firm believer. And I talk to all my students about this, that everyone has their unique visual voice in them. You just have to do enough work for it to come out. So, um, you know, I think if you looked at my work from the nineties, you know, it was black and white, but there was still so many things that were, you know, that I see resonant today. So, so that's, that's sort of been the trajectory. Um, so someone is asking you, Kathy, how much do you plan a painting before you begin? Well, I put color down and then I try and find an image or let an image emerge. But for instance, this painting, that was not true. I, at the, I was kind of obsessed with shoes and feet and legs because I had seen a basquette painting of legs sticking into the rectangle. So I came back to my studio and did my own version of a painting that I, that I admired. Um, but it, it's very interesting to make a work of art and not know how it's gonna turn out and to improvise and to make impulsive moves and um, that's one of the things I like best about the way I, the way I work. Yeah, you know, this idea of intuition being a creative act. I mean, it can't all be thought up. It can't be intellectualized. It has to be sort of felt in the body. I firmly believe that we just sort of get out the way of ourselves and make the work and then, and then the work afterwards is to sort of listen to what it's telling you. And I think Kathy brought up a great word, this idea of obsession, you know, that I think that is how you know, most artists are linked by they're obsessed with something. And those things can change, but there's normally a common thread. Well, that actually um, uh, relates to this next question because someone is asking, how do you create these images? Um, are they montages of photos taken or a single image that you find? Um, and are they manipulated in the process somehow? So they're, they're, none of them are montages, even the one with Scout in the, the fish in the sky that was through an aquarium, um, she's standing the other side. Um, so none of them are, uh, they're all one frame, they're all made in camera. I use the dark, digital darkroom the same way I use the wet darkroom. So I'll dodge and burn, I'll change the contrast, the so color balance, um, I used to teach color printing, um, but it's all there in camera. There's not, um, that to me, even though I love some digital work for me, I have to witness it in the world. That's part of like, I don't have many rules, but that's one of my rules that it, it did exist in the world. You know, I think a more ordinary artist would have painted those peaches that we just saw. Apples. Apples. Apples, yeah. Uh, with green leaves, the way we always see them, but here they are with snow. I mean, the, the tension between the fruit and the winter is, I, I think, just stunning. Yeah, I think that's that quality of awareness, say, that you bring to the world, and Kathy, that you see. You know, like I said, I think both of you, you know, what what Nevelson was talking about, how we come into the world equipped with awareness. And it's just how we use that, right? And you, you bring that quality to the real world and you, and you see these things and you bring them to the fore and, and share them through your art with us. And Kathy, you do the same. You, know, you, you, you see these things, you bring an awareness of, of how people touch, of how people interact, of how you know, we, we exist in the world as humans and, 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 and really show that through your work. Um, so I, I thank you both for that. Um, and just, I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, someone is asking, Kathy and Sig, can you share which artists that you are currently interested in now? Is there someone particularly that, that you've, you're engaged with? Besides each other. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yes, Kathy. I want to ask Kathy what I, I will answer that, but just two paintings ago, what is happening in that painting? It's extraordinary. I could stare at it for like three hours where people are coming out from under the dress. Mm. <laughs> that one. Yeah. 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 I, I, I did a painting and it was heads, like a grid of heads. And I looked at it one day and I thought this painting isn't interesting at all. So I painted yellow all over the middle and I left a couple of heads. And then I saw this woman sitting down with a wide lap and what's coming out of her dress are some of those leftover heads. So I was just making use of a former painting. You could say mistakes that I let, I let the mistake show. No, no one knows what this painting really means because of the way I painted it. I, I love that it's sort of this, to me, it's like this mother hen, you know, yeah. sort of roosting with, with these wonderful colored eggs, you know, and it's sort of this inclusiveness that's this generosity of spirit that's in this painting. Mm -hmm. um, someone is asking, Kathy, I see references to textiles in your paintings. Can you comment on that? Let me just say an artist that I've been looking at, which is um, I read writers saying that my, my figures lack facial features, which really wounded me because who wants to lack anything or that they're featureless. But when I look at Matisse, he does the same thing. He loves that oval head and he doesn't always put eyes, nose and mouth. He loves the shape and he thinks that's enough. And so I looked at Matisse for solace. Oh, so lovely. Yeah, I love that. I mean, and I think the Ninth Street women and talking about influences, I mean, I'm grateful to sort of all women that sort of came before and, um, you know, not an easy path um, in a patriarchal society. And we need to be hearing from more voices and more voices and what we can learn from each other, you know. Um, I saw the Alice Neal show um, at, uh, I went to New York once uh, recently and uh, saw the Alice Neal show at the Met and that blue line that she paints around her figures just held me in place. Um, she is someone who I've always been drawn to and also Sophie Carl, the photographer writer. Um, she's, you know, I tend to um, always, uh, I'm inspired by a lot of women um, and can put a list in the chat if anyone wants it. Thank you, thank you. Well, we've reached the end of our hour and I can't thank you both enough for your wonderful work, for your insights on each other's work and for you know, um, really energizing this evening and, and being so generous of your time um, to both me and to the Farnsworth. And I want to really thank the Farnsworth also for recognizing um, both of you and your work. Someone did ask if um, the Farnsworth has work um, in their collection by both of you. And the answer is, is, uh, is yes. So um, you, can, you can come to the Farnsworth and see examples by both of your work. Um, and also plastered on the wall of the Farnsworth, if you walk down the sidewalk, you see um, almost a whole block of six flowers. Yeah, mm -hmm. wonderful big banner. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Suzette, thank you so much. This has been, I mean, it's been such a joy to, to work with you. I mean, I, I, the time that you put into the, putting together the presentation and the parallels and, you know, I just can't thank you enough. Really wonderful. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure doing it. It really was. And I learned something as well. Since we have a few minutes, I'll just ask, so what is next, Kathy? I know you have a show coming up. Um, at the Har at Harvard, and then, is that right? Not too long from now? At the yes, and um, if you're in Milan, I have a solo show at Kaufman Repetto, which is up now, but I understand everyone who lives in Milan leaves in August. <laughs> I wish I was there, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Um, but at the Carpenter Center, right? Yes. That, that is supposed to open in the fall, okay. if all goes well. 
Wonderful. And next summer you'll be at, um, you're having a, a, a solo show at the Portland Museum of Art. Oh, fantastic. Right. And Sig, do you have a, other shows that you would want to mention just coming up? Yeah, I'm, um, I have a solo show in London in uh, end of January at um, Huxley Parlor Gallery. And, um, and then I'm part of the uh, um, on action, in action show at uh, CMCA that is uh, opening end of September. So um, two things. And then I'm hard at work on a, on a new book. So never, never a, a moment off, always on to the next. Right, Kathy? There you both go, that work ethic. It <laughs> well, thank you both. I guess that um, we'll just wrap up, say good night to everyone, and thank you all for joining us online. And Kathy and Sig, again, thank you again for your time and your insights. So thank, thank you, you so much, Suzette. You've been great. Wonderful. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Kathy, I'll be in touch. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks so much. Have a beautiful evening. <laughs>